My name is Doran Stember. I'm, I'm a urologist in New York, and my specialty within urology is men's health, which includes sexual function, testosterone-related issues, and male fertility. Um, but I have, since the pandemic, uh, when I left Mount Sinai Hospital, where I was previously in the Department of Urology, I've been focusing almost exclusively on testosterone, hormone health. And uh, I've been doing it with a company called Fountain. What was it about, you know, the medical field and helping people that attracted you to it initially? Yeah, my, my father uh, is, a, is a doctor. I've always looked up to him. Um, he's always been a really role model for me. And, and he, you know, I remember as a kid growing up, he, 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 he was so comforting to me and, and my siblings. And it just made us feel, I just felt very safe with him. And I don't know if it was specifically because he was a doctor uh, or because of his nature and, and, you know, which one led to the other, but I knew he was a doctor. I knew he took care of patients. I'm, I'm in New York. I apologize. There's going to be a lot of background noise. Sorry about that. Um, but I, it just always was inspiring to me that he made people feel safe and comfortable. So that was always very appealing to me. So I went, I went to medical school at NYU and, um, and then I went and decided to do urology residency. And uh, as I went through the urology residency, as, as you get towards the end of the, of the residency, you have to decide whether you want to become a general urologist, which means you do, you do five years of residency training and go into practice. You, you do some of everything, but you don't get incredibly focused on one specific aspect of urology. Or do you do a fellowship where you train for another one or two years and focus on something more intensively, which then is more of an academic track. You tend to be in an academic department, have residents training under you, medical students give lectures. And I decided I'd rather be an expert at something and try to become the best at something or, you know, one of the best at something than to be a generalist. So it was a little hard to figure out what I wanted to do. You have female urology, um, you have oncology in urology, prostate cancer, bladder cancer. Uh, you have pediatric urology. None of those things particularly appeal to me for various reasons. Um, but this field of sexual medicine, men's health, andrology is another word. That's sort of the male version of gynecology. Um, there's different names for it. That appealed to me because it, it, it was involved talking to men about things that are very personal to them and extremely important to them. And it's hard for them, I observe, to find people who also felt comfortable talking to them about these the same things and had a lot of information to give them that would help them. And I always felt very comfortable talking to them. And I, I noticed that when patients saw that, they immediately opened up and they were very grateful often. And uh, it's just a nice field because you're helping guys with things that are important to them. It's hard for them to find someone to talk to them about. There's a lot that can be done. It, it may seem very nuanced to people who are even other urologists who are not in the field. They may seem like unimportant differences, but sometimes these little differences can make a huge difference in the guy's life and his family's life and his partner's life. So that's why I was attracted to the field. So I did a two-year fellowship uh, in New York, and then and then I joined the urology department at Mount Sinai Hospital, where I trained as a resident. And I was, um, you know, I, I I really enjoyed being there. It's a great place to be, a great department and chairman. And during the pandemic, we started working from home. It was it, it went from in person. I was doing surgery uh, procedures, seeing patients in the office, and all of a sudden. Things changed. The hospital shut down like everything else shut down. We started doing telemedicine. First time I'd ever done telemedicine. Didn't, uh, you know, it was, it was very, very new to everybody. Everyone had a hard time with it. Um, I realized pretty quickly with my family that all of us were home. Kids were in the apartment. They weren't going to school. My wife started working from home. And we, we moved to Florida because instead of being in an apartment in Manhattan, we, we had a place to be in that we could stay in Florida with, with my wife's parents. It was really helpful for us to, to be there. We were all working remotely anyway, and it was a nicer environment for us at the time. Uh, and during this time, I um, started thinking about 
a, a new opportunity that I had been actually thinking about for, for a year or two, which was direct to consumer testosterone therapy, uh, being able to help men with specifically testosterone when, when they had trouble finding someone local to treat it. Um, and there is a big access problem in general. And as terrible as all the things related to COVID were, one, one silver lining is that uh, there, the previous need to have an in-person visit was at least temporarily waived during the public health emergency. So we were able to see patients. There's still a lot of applicable regulations and laws and, and it depends on the state where the patient is, but you can actually see patients and, and prescribe testosterone therapy if they qualify and they have to qualify based on the usual criteria. So it, it opened up a new pathway to have an impact on, on guys who were not only had trouble finding a specialist, but in, in, in some cases were in other states and, and or, or in rural areas and they had no access at all and they didn't know, didn't know where to turn. So, so that's how we found and started um, really gaining steam during the, the public health emergency. With testosterone, there's such like a stigma around just all, you know, so much that goes around testosterone. And you kind of mentioned people found it uncomfortable to talk about um, certain aspects or certain things that, that um, you know, sexual health and things like that. And, and just testosterone replacement has kind of a stigma around it for some people. So you're, you're almost like, you're almost working not against that, but you're, you're trying to, to at the same time as laying out like the benefits of this and why it is, you know, potential something good for you to do. You're also trying to convince people that like, this is an okay thing to do. You're kind of like working two battles at the same time with that. Yeah. There's a lot of layers here. Um, there, there definitely is a stigma attached to the word testosterone. I think there, there's multiple reasons for that. Um, for a lot of people, the word, even the word testosterone has a negative connotation because it implies aggressiveness. And I don't think for, for a lot of people, it's not a positive word necessarily. The truth is it doesn't actually necessarily have anything to do with aggression. Um, it, it, it plays a role in the way men and women to some extent feel energy, mood, sex drive, ability to gain and maintain muscle in response to exercise ability to lose unwanted weight in response to exercise. For a lot of men, it plays a role in their sleep quality. Uh, for a lot of men, it plays a role in their ability to focus, be motivated. You know, some men describe it as um, an overall sense of well-being when they have normal testosterone levels that's, that declines as their T levels decline over time. So it, it can affect a guy from the time he wakes up until the time he goes to bed. And it can affect his uh his relationships his 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 sense of self-worth it's not one thing and and when st levels decline various aspects affect men differently some guys feel very fatigued some guys have this kind of sense of brain fog some guys just start feeling physically weak they lose the motivation to exercise and maintain good health so it means different things to different people but those are all common factors but the word testosterone implies aggression to some people. And, and, and the interesting thing is some patients, have, the ones who are particularly worried about that aspect are ones who tend to feel irritable and maybe are, are perceived as aggressive a little bit by people around them. And pretty amazingly, when, they're, when they do have low testosterone levels and their testosterone levels are restored to normal levels, they often become, you could say, less aggressive. Really, it's less irritable because they just feel better in general. So it's often the opposite of what they might expect. That's one reason that there's some negative connotations when people hear these terms. Another is illicit use, uh, abuse, steroids. And this is the reason that testosterone therapy is in the category of controlled substances. Controlled substances are substances that have potential for abuse and they may have mildly addictive or habit forming properties. And when men have truly low testosterone levels that are part of a clinical syndrome, a clinical condition, and they've been evaluated properly, then they deserve to at least understand the risks and benefits of treatment and the implications of starting treatment. 
that is a completely different situation than a young guy typically who has good health and has normal testosterone levels who just wants to get strong for the beach or the or bodybuilding competitions. And that's the popular notion that people think of often when they hear about testosterone treatment. So it really is, that's an abuse. Uh, it's not much to do at all with the mainstream practice of testosterone therapy, but um, it definitely carries that negative connotation. So, so a lot of people, even, even many medical providers, I find just sort of recoil when they hear the term. It's crazy to think that, you know, just what a stigma can do or what like a, what an idea, even an untrue one can do in, in a field where people associate it with so much research, so much science, so much science, so much thought, like if you're, if we're kind of like going to agree that we're, we're following a set of rules of, of the scientific method and, and, you know, things like that, then you know, it's, it's almost crazy to think that even people within that field could be biased by their own, you know, personal thoughts that are, that could be, and probably are wrong about a given idea. Yeah. Some of it is familiarity. There, there's medicine is such a wide ranging field and, and, and a neurosurgeon's life and experience looks nothing like a psychiatrist. And they're, they're both doing very high level work, very important work, but they're two ends of the universe and, and they have very little overlap. And those are two extreme examples, but there are a lot of silos, you know, my, as my subspecialty of urology, I have to be familiar with the language that the prostate cancer surgeons use and deal with. And, and that one in particular, there's, there's touch points that I have with them, but the day-to-day -day and, and the procedures you may be doing surgeries and the medicines, they're all different. So as you get further and further apart into different specialties, um, you don't, you speak the same language, I would say, you know, we can understand each other's language. It's almost like a different language, but we don't really have an in-depth knowledge and things change so fast, even within a field. So uh, you, you go to medical school, it's increasingly in the rear view mirror and, and you just lose touch with what is happening in other fields. So a lot of what people, even doctors and, and other medical providers are familiar with is what they were trained and what they were exposed to and then what's around them as they, as they practice. And so it's, it doesn't seem surprising to me that people don't necessarily have completely informed views on things that are outside of their field. Um, it, it's not so different to me than where anxiety and depression was as clinical conditions 20 to 30 years ago, where there was more of a stigma to say you had anxiety or depression or, or being treated or, or seeing a psychiatrist or psychologist was considered shameful much more than it would be today. I, I think it's been largely destigmatized. I hope it has been. I, I mean, that's my sense. And that's just a matter of time and exposure and a collective change in thinking, hopefully, you know, in society because there is no, nothing wrong with having those conditions and it, people live happier, better, more full lives when they're appropriately diagnosed and treated for whatever their condition may be. In medicine, you're either, you're, you're working towards one or two things, extending the length of someone's life or improving the quality of their lives. And as long as it fits into those, one of those two categories, it's potentially something that's worth doing and you, you have to balance the the risks and potential negative issues that may come along with any treatment plan. But as long as you discuss everything in as much detail as possible with the patient and they are fully aware of the, the potential pros and cons of, of a treatment option and they have multiple options, then they should be able to make their own decision. And you mentioned kind of like the, the, the world changing and in a changing world how do you see, you know, because of the pandemic and, you know, so many different things happen because of that and, and telehealth you mentioned is one of the big yeah. ones when it comes to the medical field, how does that Im impact, and, and maybe you, you've seen it already, how it impacts people's perception of the medical field, how it impacts people's perception of, you know, a doctor or a nurse or 
you know, because, because a lot of times telehealth, like with different things that I've used them with fountain, it's like, okay, I can, I can utilize that service. Even if I'm in a different state, even if I'm in, you know, a completely different region than that, where those people are. Um, so does it, does it feel like to you that the perception is changing and in what, in what ways is it changing? I think telemedicine is absolutely amazing. I, it, it, it really gives, to me, dignity to patients. Um, I, I used to have patients sit, in, like many providers, patients would sit in the office for a long time. They'd often have to take a day off work or half a day off work, drive, park, have trouble parking, pay, and then you sit and wait. And sometimes the visit's five or 10 minutes. And so it, it doesn't necessarily need to be more than that, but that was just the way it was done. And once I started doing telemedicine, I, I, I think back on the crowded waiting room and people waiting and, and looking at their watches and checking in the front. And I, I, I just, I, it's hard for me to imagine going back into that situation because I just feel like it's, it, it's something that is removing a little bit of dignity from patients when, when I, we could just be having a scheduled call that is much more likely to start on time. Um, just because people are not physically moving around rooms and, and changing over the tables and things like that. Um, and, and if on either side, something changes, it, it's, it's so much easier for either side, the provider or the patient to make a change. In many cases, patients don't have to take a day off work. They literally just walk to another room and, and are on the, you know, looking at their phone for 10 minutes or step outside into the parking lot. And I, I just think that is, is really just giving a huge amount of time back to people, which is maybe the most important thing here about telemedicine. Um, and it allows people to have access to providers they were, really wouldn't necessarily have access to for, for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. Uh, it is amazing to, to be able to just drop into other states and, and see people in, from different walks of life. I really love that. Of course, you have to have a license for every state that the patient's located and you can't just suddenly jump into other states. You have to go through a process, a licensing process. It's a formal process. That's a good thing to point out too, because with the internet, you know, people have this kind of conception or misconception that I can do whatever I want on the internet. And it's, it's no one's going to know, or no one's going to find out, or no one's going to catch me or, you know, no one's going to care sometimes. Like I can start my own thing. I can do this. I can do that. Where, you know, it's important that you pointed out that you, in order to do this right, you have to still go through the proper channels as if it was going to be, in a lot of cases, an in-person meeting, and, and you're still doing the same things. So I think that's it's a very valuable thing to that people know. Yeah, the, 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 the standard of care, the clinical standard of care shouldn't be different. I mean, there are sometimes minor differences. Uh, it's You can't necessarily have a patient step on a scale, but they can report their weight to you. Uh, for example, but there, there are, there are many, many aspects and most of the important aspects, depending on the condition you can replicate in a, in person, well, when I say in person, a uh, face-to-face visit that doesn't in any meaningful way differ from the, uh, in-person encounter. It's not always true. There are times when you absolutely have to have in-person encounters and you have to also understand what's important and, and what might need to happen for a patient to actually go and be referred to somebody or, or have the capability to see them in person based on a finding or a conversation or a comment. It, it, you really do need a combination of both. So I, I don't think it should replace in-person encounters. It should just be a tool that has um, its, its own advantages and, and some disadvantages too. And I think one of the advantages are you can kind of like make your health more of a priority because it doesn't take all that time out of your day. You know, you can have multiple check-ins throughout the the year. You can, you know, Oh, how is my testosterone doing? Or how, you know, I want to get my blood work done or I want to get, um, you know, something I did recently was like a, um, a DNA thing, which is, I found very interesting. You can take more control over your health and like understand your, you know, the biomarkers and understand more. And, and, and that leads to just, I think more empowerment on 
just every aspect of health, whether it's how you eat, how you exercise, you know, just anything like your risk factors for things. This episode is brought to you by Move Your Body Apparel, a Lexington-based, community-ran, premium activewear brand that promotes the importance of daily movement. Save 20% off your first order with the link below or use code TWR20 online at mybapparel.com. If you're tired of searching for a coach or trainer, somebody who knows what they're talking about and has experience, make sure you go check out the new Coach's Corner on weightroompodcast.com. You can find quality, qualified coaches to help you achieve your goals, whether that's in bodybuilding or just general fitness. Stop wasting time and start achieving your goals today. The link to the Coach's Corner is down in the description below. Another thing I want to talk about is how do you build that? Because whenever I think of like, especially more of like a kid, I guess, but like whenever you go to the doctor, it's it's that like, it's that loyalty, it's that trust, it's that I've been going, my family's been going here for years. How do you build that, um, maybe not that for years aspect, um, depending on which, you know, in, you know, specific thing that you're doing within telehealth, but how do you build that, I guess, that trust and that relationship over um, this kind of communication? That's a great question. I, I don't think there's any difference. I think you look people in the eye, um, that's always sometimes a little hard because <laughs> I'm looking you at the eye, but I don't know if it looks to you like I'm looking you at the eye or looking away from you because I'm not looking right into the camera. So I, I try to put the other person right near the camera to make it as close as possible. Uh, but having a relaxed conversation and hearing someone and responding to them and and caring about the details of their care and, and following up on something and being honest with them about the potential good things and the potential problems. I, I think that's how you build trust and, and a meaningful relationship. I mean, you definitely want to make sure that you, you have uh, a sense of trust between the patient and the provider. That's the most important thing. And the, and the way to do that is just to tell the truth at all times to them. What, what I, I tell them what I really believe. I, I tell patients if I think that there's, a strong likelihood that they're going to benefit from testosterone therapy. And here's the reasons why I tell them what I think. I don't think testosterone therapy is the right thing for you, even though you have some symptoms that you might've thought were from low T and here's the reasons why. And I tell them sometimes I'm not sure. I, uh, these are the factors that make me think that testosterone therapy is, is worth trying. And here's the reasons I think that are you against it a little bit? And then we just discuss it further. And if, if we, really are on the fence, then we get more information. We may repeat labs or we get more records. There's things you can do. And, and there's no trick to it besides that. I think if, if you do that, you're doing the right thing um, as a provider, you're doing the right thing as a person and people sense that and they, they trust you. And you have to, you're, you're exposing yourself, you know, vulnerability, vulnerabilities and, and your health and so they deserve, patients deserve to feel that way. And it's just easier for me, and I think it should be for any provider to think that way and talk that way to patients because then there's nothing to remember. You just try to remember to do the right thing and be honest. And so I haven't seen any difference in, in the quality of relationships that develop over time. We have, I have some great relationships that have developed it since telemedicine, meeting the patient for the first time. Patients I've never met in person. Yeah. So, and I have some patients that I knew in person and now we're doing telemedicine. Right. It doesn't feel really different to me. It's, it's interesting you say that, you know, I have kind of a, a similar experience on this podcast where I talk to so many different people and then I happen to meet them in person and it's like, I've, I haven't met you before really. And then I do meet you and I already feel like I have somewhat of a connection with you. I already feel like I know some stuff about you. It's, it's, yeah. it's so bizarre how like I can see you through this camera and that like can establish a relationship. And I really, it's just pixels. It's just like a, it's a picture of you, but we can still like have a connection. It's, it's just so bizarre to me that that's possible. But um, in regards to, um, you know, being a doctor and, and I'm just very interested in kind of your perspective on this. Is it harder for you to be like, okay, we know what the problem is but I can't help you? Or is it harder for you to say, I just 
don't know what the pro like I, I, we've looked at all this stuff and I'm sorry, but I can't really help you. Like which one to you is harder? In, the, in both cases, you can't help someone, but in one case, you don't know the reason. And the other case, right? Well, if I know the reason that someone is having a problem and I can't help them, then at least I can refer them to someone who can help them. I mean, if, if I, if I, for example, if someone needs something in person, I understand what the problem is, but they need in-person care for whatever reason, maybe it's a procedure. Then I, I actually feel pretty good about that because I can refer them to, I can guide them to where to go next to get the right thing. That one example would be in-person versus not, or maybe they should see an endocrinologist or, or another specialty and I try to get them to the right place. So I, so that that's not a problem necessarily at all. If I don't know the reason, you know, sometimes you don't know the, un, the exact underlying reason for a problem, but you still understand what the problem itself is. You still understand the manifestation, maybe not the root cause. And and very often you can you can direct treatment at the manifestation. So you people always want to understand why is this happening. An example of this is erectile dysfunction. It, it, there are numerous causes. Some of them are nerve damage. Some of them are um, problems with blood vessels or scar tissue uh, or or stress or adrenaline. I mean, there's numerous possible issues. Often it's actually a combination of the factors. Uh, and in some, in some ways for some treatments, those treatments will apply regardless of the underlying cause. The better you understand the underlying cause, the better you can treat and, and, and do some supplemental therapies possibly or recommendations, but you can still often treat the actual problem, even if you don't always know exactly the underlying cause or the it's broken down into 50% this 50% that. So there's almost always something you can do for people to help them, whether it's referral or treat one of one of the aspects that are bothering them, even if you don't understand exactly the true deep underlying problem. And you also have to be able to recognize when, if you don't understand the underlying problem, that might just be a matter of referring them somewhere else for more testing that you can't necessarily do yourself. Sometimes it's important to do that. And sometimes it's not particularly important. There, there's no possibility of something dangerous, for example. Right. If someone says, I, I have this, you know, twitch in my, my thigh that happens once every six months. What's the reason? I mean, you, you could do a big neurological workup, which will probably show nothing. And as long as you have reason to believe there's nothing dangerous underlying it, you don't, it's not necessarily that important, but if they have a mass that they can feel some, you know, that's doesn't move around and it feels stuck under their, in the same area, whether it twitches or not, there could be something dangerous there. So you got to make sure they get a physical exam and see the right person. So some of it is just knowing when there's a, a possibility that something's actually bad happening or, or no real possibility of anything bad. And, may just bother them, but it's, you're not likely to find the actual reason for this twitch. And in some ways it's not going to change anything for them, even if you theoretically could. Yeah. And I think that's such a crazy thing that, that people in the medical field have to do is they have to almost have like this, this knowledge of like what all these things could or couldn't be, what, you know, and of course, like you have your specialties, you have that kind of thing, but just in general, it's like, oh, this isn't that big of a deal, or this is something that we need to be more concerned about, or this is something that we need to be really concerned about. Like, you know, there's the body just has so many different aspects to it from the smallest level to the, you know, the biggest level and how one tiny thing can go wrong and how that can, can cause something. And like the fact that people know, oh, that's because of this, or I have a, you know, a pretty good guess that it's because of one of these things. It's just amazing that we've come that far in our, in our knowledge and, and obviously too, in our technology. Yeah. So you have to build systems, hopefully where you have redundancy and in that way, you're less likely to, to miss things. 
And it's also the reason that people tend to subspecialize over time so that they can focus on one thing. They are very likely to, common things are common and um, there tends to be patterns and you just have to gain with through reading and study and exposure to conferences and experience when things are not so obvious, but maybe problematic. There's good and bad to this, to the subspecialization. You know, you become expert in, in a relatively narrow field, but it's hard sometimes for patients to, there's gaps in between these fields sometimes, you know, something doesn't fit exactly one place or another. And it's hard for patients to know exactly which, it's not just going to a urologist necessarily. They need to go to the right type of urologist. So right. I think there's challenges in both directions. As a doctor, especially being in kind of a field to where you can help people in a very straightforward way and it can improve their lives in such like dramatic way sometimes, how, like, what is your thought behind, not necessarily now, but in the future, whether that's a hundred years, a thousand years, whatever, getting to the point where there is this all, you know, this all in one fixer upper kind of thing, you know, like, you know, instead of just testosterone, it's like, Hey, we're going to do a complete body boost, you know, comparing it maybe to like a video game where you enter a cheat code and, you know, your health just right. takes a complete, you know, it goes back to a hundred, you know, what is the reality in your mind behind something like that? Because we do kind of have that in, in different areas in small ways. Now. I think that testosterone is the closest thing I can think of to that for some people who have, who have really low testosterone and it really impacts their life. This is not necessarily everybody who has clinical testosterone deficiency, but there are some people who, when, when you have a systemic condition like, like depression, which can be caused by, to some extent, by low testosterone levels, it makes it feel like everything is down or low or, or subdued and you find it hard to, you don't feel good physically. You don't necessarily feel like yourself, or at least the way you think of yourself physically. Uh, and that is the kind of thing that does feel to some people like everything is, a, is down or negative in some way. And, uh, and when they're treated properly, it can feel like everything lifts, everything improves. And that's not necessarily experience of everyone by any means, but it does happen sometimes. And that's really amazing to see because those people like you, their lives are changed and they, they are the most happy, grateful people. And that's really amazing. So I feel like I have seen something what you described with the video game uh, at least a few times. It's, and it's not necessarily that dramatic for everybody. It's often one or two factors that are particularly bothering them that you try to work on and improve. And that doesn't mean it's less important. Those things can be extremely important to those people. But this all-encompassing thing, I, I, I mean, I would imagine that testosterone deficiency that is associated with severe symptoms that's properly treated could be in that category. And, and clinical depression, whatever the reason is, it doesn't necessarily have it in many cases, most cases doesn't have anything to do with testosterone. When that's properly treated, that can make a big difference. Um, and uh, there, there's a few other conditions like that, but not too many. There's not too many that are, that are everything from head to toe, from morning to light feels gloomy and then can change to really good. So it, it is possible, just not, hopefully most people would never get there in the first place. Well, most of the day-to-day -day conversations I have are regular people who are just they're just trying to get through their day, and and they're, I, you know, we they're not necessarily going for superhuman because they can't even imagine that. They're just trying to they're just trying to regain a sense of their identity and their basic basic happiness and quality of life. So they're it just depends on where you're starting. I mean, it, it really is all based on perspective. So the very least people should, should have the best chance at basic, basic happiness and, and feeling, feeling good in general. 
and that doesn't need to be taken too far. It just, you know, you, you just when people are, are feeling low, they're feeling down, they're feeling weak, they're feeling like they can't focus, they can't function the way they want to, they can't, they can't uh, take care of their family members, they can't even take care of their own health in other simple ways. The first step is just to get you to feeling like you're capable of doing those things and, and being at least minimally motivated to do those things. So that's the, that's the most basic step. And then it's a process of optimization within reason, but you, you always have to balance trying to improve quality of life with any intervention you do, you have to make sure that you don't start to cause problems too. So it's not just like the more, the better. It's definitely not that. It's, it's finding the right balance between quality of life with any intervention you do and making sure that you are always aware that the balance can swing out of whack and you can start to introduce problems too. And you never want to do that. And as far as like people who do, or at least who you see and maybe, and just in general, like, do you think that there's more people who make testosterone replacement the starting point? Or do you think that people, more people are like, Hey, I want to live a healthier life. So they start doing other things. They realize that they can't do them as well. And then they seek out the testosterone replacement. I think that in most cases, there are people who start out saying, I want to optimize everything. It's not necessarily a badly intentioned thought process, but, but in many cases, they are really not the right candidates for testosterone treatment if they're just focused on optimization and, and better for that would be to focus as long as they have normal testosterone levels and they're evaluated would be to focus on behavioral and lifestyle modifications. And those are people who typically don't have low testosterone in the first place. So you're not really taking, treating a low level and bringing it back to the normal range. You are trying to improve, so to speak on, on a normal level in the first place. And the problem there is that as I mentioned before, you can start to introduce new problems they wouldn't have had otherwise. And that's different than a guy who he's not necessarily looking to optimize everything when everything was fine because his natural testosterone levels, for example, if we're talking about testosterone, were, were in good shape. But over the years, as he gets past the age of 30 to 35, they, they tend to start to decline naturally one to two percentage a year on average. Then before he realizes it, five, 10 years goes by and his quality of life is starting to really decline. And uh, so those people typically are find it or seek it, the testosterone evaluation, I mean, um, and possible treatment because they're having a problem, not because they're starting, starting out saying, how, what's the most I can possibly do for myself. So it kind of falls, it tends to fall into two different categories like that. Gotcha. And you mentioned, and, and by the way, oh, sorry, even people who, or on testosterone therapy. It doesn't mean that they don't um, need to exercise or, or focus on good diet, but very often they do because you, know, you have 20 year old guys, I'm sure everyone you know remembers or is at that age now, there's 20, 22 year old guys. If you check their testosterone levels, they've got probably in many cases, very healthy testosterone levels, but not all of them are in shape. Many of them are very out of shape. Testosterone levels don't equal good health and fitness. You, the, if you sit on the couch and eat potato chips, you're not, you're, you're not going to be in good shape, even if your testosterone level is good. And the same is true for guys on testosterone replacement therapy. You have to make sure that they, uh, they know that this will amplify their response to diet and exercise. They still have to di do diet and exercise. It's still very important. They can't let that go. So it's not a replacement for, it's not a replacement for, for doing the right things uh, on a basic health level. You know, all you're doing is normalizing their testosterone levels from, from a low level to a normal level. This podcast is sponsored by Smoking Gun Coffee, a veteran-owned coffee company that strives to give back to those in need. Don't forget to use code TWR10 for a 10% discount at checkout. This episode is brought to you by Move Your Body Apparel, a Lexington-based, community-ran, premium activewear brand that promotes the importance of daily movement. Save 20% off your first order with the link below or use code TWR20 online at mybapparel.com. You mentioned the um, the term normal testosterone. Now, 
from a medical perspective, whether it's testosterone or, or any other thing that you can measure, does that change with what becomes normal within a given time period or where do we find that normal range? This is a really good question. It, it's, it's not so easily defined. The, the, there are thresholds that are commonly understood to be the, the difference between low T level and normal T level. The most commonly considered threshold is a total testosterone level of 300. If you're below it, you're low. And if you're above it, you're normal. And obviously that's a big simplification. That's because if someone has a level of 301 versus 299, they shouldn't really be in two different categories. It's more of a spectrum. As you go lower towards 300 and, and then below 300, you're more likely to be symptomatic. And having a level of 290 is you're in, probably in better shape than if you have a level of 190. So again, it's, it's a spectrum. Instead of focusing on a, a level, first of all, there's, there's multiple labs you can do. If not just total testosterone, there's a test called free testosterone. There's a test called luteinizing hormone that's often relevant in helping to make a dis- determination about, is this patient likely to benefit from testosterone treatment? If the, the overall picture, the symptoms, the history, the labs, if they overall give a good rationale for thinking that this patient's symptoms are caused by, or at least largely contributed to to by his declining or or clearly low testosterone levels, then that's a basis for making a mutual decision that a trial of testosterone therapy is likely to help those symptoms that are caused by or contributed to by the, the deficient levels. But if you don't really believe that the symptoms are caused by low testosterone in the first place, then raising your testosterone level is probably not going to help those symptoms very much. So um, that's really the fundamental question to start. But it does require not just a low level, however you define low levels of the blood test, but it also requires having the symptoms that commonly go along with the, the condition. So if someone says, I feel great, everything's amazing, and they have a low test on a lab for some reason. I mean, they wouldn't necessarily seek that test, have a reason to seek it, but they may be drawn for some other reason. Definitely, you don't want to treat a number without another another good reason to treat. Of course, it's it's helpful to have those numbers, but but just bettering people's kind of understanding and education behind all those important things. Um, right, which is why that it, it it does take experience. It does take specialized training. Um, you can't just go by a number. If you go by a number, you are going to think a lot of people have low testosterone who don't really um, deserve treatment. When I say deserve, they, they don't really qualify for treatment uh, if you're just basing it on the numbers. And you also may miss people who have a T level that's above 300. If that's the only thing you're looking at. You could be missing that they have low free testosterone, which is their effective testosterone. You could be You could be missing that they are extremely symptomatic, that they were previously at a much higher level, and they've had a significant decline over the past few years. There's, there's a lot of specific differences between one patient and another that goes beyond the exact number on a report. And, and those things are what we focus on, you know, to make sure that we're, we're doing the right thing for the patients, basically. Yeah. So when it comes to just general factors and general things within our lives, like what are some of the things that d- do affect out, you know, outside of just our genetics and maybe we're experiencing naturally getting lower testosterone? Like what, what would you see as habits or behaviors or factors, just environmental or whatever that do affect testosterone? So there's, there are um, a lot of theories uh, about this. There's some, there's some data. The data is, is not so easy to, to get in a really high quality way because guys are different ages, the tests at different labs are, are done in slightly different ways, depending on what time of day, even for a given individual, the levels could go up or down. Um, even if you tested yourself the exact same time, one day to the next, your levels might be a little bit different. And I've had some patients where they, they were, I ordered labs to be drawn. The phlebotomist is drawing the different tubes meant to be for different tests. And this is 
we're talking about the same vein at the exact same time, one tube replacing the other. And this, I remember this happening at least twice where the phlebotomist accidentally put the same tube on instead of two different tubes testing different things and it ended up with two different testosterone results at the same time, which normally you would never do. And they, never, they weren't hugely different, but there, there was a difference, which I thought was, was really interesting. So, you know, often you need multiple tests or, or, or it has to be very clearly one way or another. That, that's what you can't just take anyone. You always have to take these numbers with a little bit of a grain of salt. You can't focus exactly on what the number is and, and think that is hugely important to the exclusion of everything else, all the other considerations. So it's, a, it's a whole picture thing. In terms of other factors that can affect testosterone, um, there's a lot of debate about how much diet and exercise can improve there is definitely evidence that having good diet, having a good exercise habit um, will improve your testosterone level, but it's also a little bit of a chicken and egg phenomenon because if you have low testosterone, it becomes harder to exercise and, and, and often people are demotivated and they're tired. And when people are tired, they tend to eat junk food instead of healthier food. So, and then what's causing what the, the low testosterone is causing them to exercise less, which in turn is causing low testosterone. Um, and you can say the same thing with good testosterone levels. So it's a little bit, it is hard to tease this out completely. I mean, what, what, what's known for sure is that you try to optimize the things you can control to the best extent you can. Diet, exercise, sleep, minimizing stress, keeping good health in general and, and following up with a medical provider prevent, with preventative medicine. Those are things that are at least to some extent within people's control, although it's not necessarily easy to do a great job at all those things. And then if, if you can't make it happen, then you have further testing and evaluation. And you, while you can have an impact, and even if you can't have an impact on your T level with your, with your behavior and your lifestyle, you still should do those things because they definitely make a difference whether you're not, or not you're on testosterone treatment. So um, it's a really good question, but, but, but nothing moves the needle like actual testosterone therapy. If you have real clinical deficiency in testosterone levels, okay? there's not, there's not any other way that I'm aware of to make a really meaningful difference. You can make, you can make a little bit of a difference, but it may not change the way the guy feels or his symptoms in, in a way that's meaningful to him. And is there any, and it kind of goes back to the chicken or the egg thing, I guess, again, but is there any correlation between how long, not necessarily one person, but in a line of people, some that, that those people live, you know, my grandpa, my dad, me, my son would live. Is, is there any correlation between that and like having higher and or normal and or lower whatever testosterone levels? Yeah. Another really good question there, I think it's hard to say that because there, there are so many factors that play into mortality lifespan, so many factors. It, it, it would be hard to say that one is due to testo testosterone levels being lower or higher, but what you may be alluding to is there, there have been a lot of studies and a lot of attention over the last few years that's showing that we, we know that guys, as they get older, once you're past the age 30 to 35, testosterone levels for an individual tend to decline. And with, with each decade of life, you're more likely to lower and lower testosterone levels. That, that, that's been well known for a long time. But what's really interesting is that a 50 year old man today has on average lower testosterone levels and significantly lower testosterone levels than a 50 year old man 20 years ago. And, and he has lower levels than the same age man 20 years before that. That's a really interesting change. No one knows exactly why that's happening. Um, is it because our lifestyles are more sedentary and, and, and the activity and the hard work and more likely to be working with your, your hands? Maybe that really is a huge factor that we just don't see in modern life. And, and the, you know, our version of being active is just simply doesn't compare to what it was 60, 70 years ago. That's very possible. Maybe there's, the food we're eating is much more processed. I mean, that's for sure true. Um, how much of an impact is that having over a lifetime? Not totally well understood. Um, other factors, air quality, war qual uh, air and water quality, probably all these things, these environmental factors and 
and just the way people are living their lives. So that's what we're seeing. It's becoming more and more prevalent at every age level because age match controls from, from previous generations were at higher levels. And then no matter when you were living, as you get older, past 35, it's going to decline. So right now it's it's affecting more and more men is, is the bottom line. In terms of like getting that, that um, testosterone right, you know, it's like, okay, you're a good candidate. We're going to start uh, replacement therapy. What is that? And I'm sure it's different for everyone. But what does that timeline in general look like? Depends on what the specific treatment is. Uh, the two major categories of treatment are topical cream or gel or, in, or injections. And with either treatment, people can potentially start feeling benefits within days. So very, very quickly within, within days to a week. Often it takes longer than that. It, it may take longer because that individual's body and makeup and where they're starting uh, is different from someone else. So some people will take two, three, four, even five weeks to start noticing a real improvement. You may have the wrong dose to start and you, and you determine that after, got to give it a little bit of time, but after six or eight weeks, reassess, check labs again, check in with the patient, how he's feeling, what he's experiencing. Has there been any changes? And uh, you may need to adjust the dose up or even potentially down. There are some differences between cream and injections. The, the cream or gel, depending on what the specific medication you're using, tends to be uh, a little bit slower acting than the injections. Injections go into the bloodstream faster and people tend to have their a response sooner. But it, it is a process. It's it, people, it's not a, it's not a, meant to be a quick fix necessarily. You, you wanna make progress with, with treatment, with quality of life improvements but you have to do so in a responsible and, and deliberate way. So you, there, there are some standard starting doses for each of these things um, or a range of standard starting doses. And usually you start with that, you take into consideration their individual medical history, other medications they're on, what their goals are. And, uh, and, and then you make the best decision possible. And, and, and that, that too is part of the discussion with the patient. I mean, they, they don't necessarily have all, of course they don't have the experience and all the insight into the details that you do, but they, they can and should participate in the, the high level um, considerations there. Some patients will say, uh, I wanna be, go slow on this and I, I don't mind if it takes longer, I'd just rather be extra cautious and that's great. Other people say, I wanna, I, I just am feeling miserable and I, my priority is to get, get going as quickly as possible. I mean, you still never, you can't rush things. You can't do anything that's hasty um, but you can make some different decisions and, and try to do what you think is likely the, to get to the optimal response or at least a pretty good response a little bit faster, as long as you are doing it in a safe, responsible way. And there's not usually any contradiction there. You can, you can do all these things. So the patient should be involved, even in that part of the discussion. And if you were to help, let's say, everybody that could potentially benefit from testosterone replacement therapy what percentage of the population and whether that's a world population or just a, an american population what percentage of that population do you think could benefit from that it you know there's so many different definitions of testosterone deficiency low testosterone there's so many different definitions you, you can find estimates that are five to forty percent a, a, a com, commonly cited range is 25 to 40 percent of men have low testosterone levels, but even then you're, you're defining things um, so differently that it, it depends what your definitions are. It depends on what your cutoff levels are. It depends on, um, it depends on what population you're looking at. It depends on the, the age of the population the study is based on. Because if you have a, if you have a population that you're, that you're looking for, for this study and they tend to be younger, on average, a lower proportion will have clinically low testosterone. If you happen to have an older population, a higher proportion of, of you would conclude have clinically low testosterone levels. But there's no question that it is, it's at any given time across average random cross-section of men is a fairly high percentage of adult men 
have clinically low testosterone. And for any given individual who's followed decade after decade, the likelihood of having low testosterone goes up and up and up. So, you know, it depends if you're looking at the entire population, then you'll come up with different numbers. And a lot of that is associated with their age. If you're looking, if you're following an individual, what's the likelihood this is going to happen to you at some point? It's like saying, what's the likelihood you're going to, your hair is going to turn gray at some point. And it's, it's very high. It happens to some people younger, some people older. Yeah. And, and just being able to, like we're talking about before, offer an option for people now and that, that, that's more accessible, that's easier to, to help fix their problem. That, that's kind of the baseline problem. And, and just to help them with all the other symptoms. And, and there's so many that, you know, we could talk about and that you've mentioned already on the podcast that, that um, we would consider, uh, I think in today's day and age, like really big issues, you know? So just the fact that I don't want to call it simple, but, but it kind of is in a way simple, like to, to help and get this fixed for a lot of people. So it's just really cool that that's an option. I think that's a that's a good point. Uh, th there are a lot of details. There are a lot of nuances. There's that's what my my role is to focus on those things and help guys with that. But at the same time, in some ways, it is very simple. It's very fundamental. You know, guys uh, have a hormone called testosterone that peaks around age eighteen or nineteen, tends to stay elevated through the twenties. Most guys during those years tend, tend to feel good, tend to have good energy, tend to have good years, but individual circumstances, but people tend to think of those years as good years, at least physically, or at least the way they feel for the most part. And then those same guys are more likely to start to have a decline as they age and their T levels going down are often part of that. And so some, on some really fundamental level, you, you're just restoring guys quality of life. You're just making them feel better. You make them have better days, better interactions with their loved ones around them and their friends and feel better at work and feel better about themselves. So it, it often does feel very simple when you step away from it for a minute. So I think that's a, a great point. Yeah, it's really cool. Kind of, you know, like I said, that it is an option now to, to have that done, but I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. It was really cool kind of get, get to talk to you and pick your brain a little bit on, you know, the world of testosterone and, and telehealth and all these kind of these, these things that, um, testosterone not being a new thing per se, obviously, but, but, but the option for it to be, you know, an acceptable option and, and, and a more accessible option. So it was really cool to get your insight on all that. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Testosterone, this issue has been around forever there's increasing recognition now, which I think is great. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about it with you. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Yes, sir. And if you want to let people know kind of where they can, uh, they can find you or where they can, you know, get in touch with you to uh, maybe yeah. see if they can get some help. Yeah. The website is fountain TRT.com. It's all one word and you can go to the site and you can uh, take an assessment, which, which basically goes through some of the symptoms you may have. You need to be a male, you need to be over 18, and you answer some questions about medical history and, and, and symptoms you may be having. And you can sign up, and, and the process is that we, for men who qualify based on the assessment, we facilitate labs and, uh, and a visit with a, an expert provider who can review the labs with you and talk about treatment options if they're appropriate. And if, if they're not a testosterone therapy is not appropriate based on uh, lab results or, or any other aspect of an individual's health, we'll still have the visit and we'll still talk about the results and we'll still make some recommendations and tell you why we don't think it's the right thing for you right now. Maybe suggest other options for you. Sounds uh, like a, you know, really great option and, and just a, a place for people to, like I said before, take control of their health, understand more about what's going on within their body. Yeah and know what steps to take if that's not the right step. Hey, this is what you can do next to try to help solve these problems. Because at the end of the day, people want to feel empowered. And I think the more that we can let people understand what's going on within their body, the the, the better that that is. Yeah, well put. Take control of your health. That's exactly, that's exactly right. I like that. If you're tired of searching for a coach or trainer, somebody who knows what they're talking about and has experience, 
make sure you go check out the new Coach's Corner on weightroompodcast.com. You can find quality, qualified coaches to help you achieve your goals, whether that's in bodybuilding or just general fitness. Stop wasting time and start achieving your goals today. The link to the Coach's Corner is down in the description below.